A couple of years ago, I babysat for a family friend. She and her husband lived with their two kids, a girl about seven called Kay and a boy about twelve called Jay. I babysat these kids so much that we became very close, brother and sisters type of deal. They weren't difficult kids, they had a hard home life because their parents were borderline abusive, but they still were good kids. I tried my best to be a positive adult in their life. I was 18 to 19 during this. The family moved around a lot. I've known them now for over six years, and they have moved every single year. This experience happened in 2015. I was halfway through my senior year when the family moved into the house. It was nice, just built in 2013 or something like that. A nice neighborhood, but rent was really low. The mother often bragged about the steal of a deal she got from the house. To put in perspective, the average rent in this area is about $1,200 just for an apartment. These guys got a whole two-story house, three beds, four baths, freshly built in a nice neighborhood for about $650. I thought that was weird and asked if there was anything wrong with the house, to which she replied the inspection came back clear. I didn't think much beyond that. I started babysitting and I immediately felt something was off. I have anxiety, so going to a new place really puts me in a funk, so I just figured that's what it was at first. The way the home is set is important. On the bottom floor, they had a living room, dining area, and a kitchen with some other rooms. I spent most of my time in the living room, working on things for school, while the kids were upstairs playing games or with their friends. While you're in the living room, there's a wall that blocks you from seeing the stairs. Upstairs, there are bedrooms. Immediately off the stairs and above the living room is the parents' room, which was off limits to the kids. Then a loft area that looks down over the front door to make a grand foyer feeling. There's a light that can be on, which can be seen from downstairs because of the loft. Then the kids' bedrooms were down a hallway. Now, let's get into the experiences. Nothing happened really at first that was too mind-boggling. Little noises here and there. Knocks on the walls. Things being misplaced. Lights flickering. But nothing that made me think. Ghosts. I figured they got what they paid for, and my memory was garbage. After a couple of months of that, things started picking up. The kids, who were usually very sweet and kind to each other, started becoming noticeably more snappy to everyone, especially Jay. He had complained about nightmares he had started having about someone standing in his doorway watching him. His parents wouldn't listen though. Their behavior grew even worse as time went on. It was a weekend, and the parents were going to be gone for a while. The kids were upstairs doing their thing. I was downstairs in the living room, looking at a pizza to order for lunch. Out of nowhere, I hear really loud footsteps coming from above me in the parents' bedroom, thunderous even. Thinking it was the kids being little dingus meats, I immediately headed upstairs to tell them to get out, but I was greeted with the two kids standing in their doorways, staring at the closed door to their parents' room. The footsteps slash bangs still continuing inside. At this point, I thought it was an intruder and instructed the kids to get into their rooms and lock their doors. I called 911 and explained the situation. As I stayed on the phone, the footsteps continued to walk around the room. I could hear it moving to different locations of the room. Two officers arrived. So I grabbed the kids and we waited outside, the banging still continuing as one of the officers escorted us out. They came out empty-handed and said nothing was there and that it may have been something with the door because the banging stopped as soon as they opened the door. I had felt the shaking of the floor moving around the room so I knew it wasn't the door, but I guess, in my denial, I ignored it and took the kids out for ice cream trying not to think about it. Another time, the kids and I were sitting in the dining area eating dinner. It was only three of us in the house, 
and from the dining area you could see the light upstairs was on and it cast a shadow onto the front door. I was making a joke about how I'm the only one who knows how to turn off a light around here and I saw a shadow of a hand from upstairs on the front door and I think that's when it really started settling down with me that the house was haunted. The kids didn't see it and I didn't tell them. I figured it would just add stress they didn't need. I told the parents that night when they came home but they brushed me off, saying they haven't experienced anything. This continued on for a while. I would experience something, the kids would, but the parents wouldn't believe any of us. It was summer just after I graduated high school. I remember it vividly because I was awake reading articles about a huge shooting that happened in my town. That's when the banging from upstairs started happening. I was used to it at this point. But what I was not used to was the banging footsteps coming down the stairs. These steps were methodical and menacing. I felt terrible energy in the room, and it was cold despite it being in the middle of summer in the south. I counted the seconds between steps, and it was five. Every single time. I called out to the kids and told them to stop joking around, but I knew it was not the kids. I was terrified. The footsteps stopped at the bottom of the stairs, and I couldn't see who was there. Then I saw an apparition. It was of a little girl. She had brunette hair and a red dress. She looked innocent enough, but the energy in the room was so heavy I almost threw up. She looked at me, and I looked at her. She didn't move. I figured I was hallucinating and began rubbing my eyes, but when I finished rubbing them, she was right in front of me. In that situation, I couldn't move or do anything. My mind just went to kid brain, and I hid underneath the blanket I was using. I called the parents, crying, and told them to come back immediately. When they came, the energy in the room lightened and I finally came out from under the blanket. She was gone. They asked what was wrong and what happened, and I told them it didn't matter because they wouldn't believe me. I then informed them to find another babysitter because I would not be returning. I still wonder about the kids. I hope they ended up okay. They moved out of that house at the end of the year, but I'm not sure if what I saw was attached to them or not. I'm still not sure what I saw. Anyway, thanks for listening if you made it this far. Sorry if it seems so scrambled. I still have nightmares about the girl, and it's still a really frightening event to me. So this story takes place around the time of the housing crisis back in 2008 or so. I was in high school at the time. A buddy, Eric, and myself would do some urban exploring by sneaking into empty homes, abandoned or foreclosed. Of course, we do these explorations in the dead of night to avoid any trouble with the law. I can't give away the location because people now live there, and I have no scientific rational explanation for what happened. But I know what I saw and heard, so I'd like to share it with you all. So we set out around 12 a.m., just like we would any night. About an hour or so in, we find a house that I often saw on my walks to school. As we walk up to the house, we scan for anyone. Then we make our way down to the large driveway that leads into the backyard of the house. The first thing I noticed is how tall the grass was, like it hadn't been mowed in quite some time months I'd say. Then I noticed a smaller house further near the back of the property. We told ourselves we'd check that house out once we'd explored the bigger one. We enter the bigger house from the door that leads into the garage, and from the garage we stepped into the kitchen. Believe it or not, the doors were unlocked. When we enter the kitchen, we see the house was almost pitch black. We can only see a few feet ahead thanks to the street lights. So I used my only source at the time, 
a cheap flip phone with a screen brightness on max. We start our exploration down the hallway and check out each room. There are five in total, counting the two living rooms. Eric is close behind me as we make our way through each room and eventually back to the kitchen. Once in the kitchen, we chat about how nice the house is and its size given the area it's in, much bigger than the surrounding houses. As we're talking, I notice a metal decoration hanging above the kitchen doorway. It almost looked like some sort of decorative shield. I pull it from its spot and inspect it closely. Once done, I can't figure out how to put it back, so I set it between my feet on the tile floor. I take a look at my friend and take a step into the kitchen. Then we both hear what sounds like something sliding along the floor, and then a bang at the end of the hall. Eric and I both freeze and stare at one another through the streetlights shining through the kitchen window. Eric whispers to me, Is there someone here with us? Did someone follow us in? I honestly didn't know, but after a minute or two, we decide to walk down the hall and see what the noise was. As my phone's light creeps to the end of the wall, we see the shield I just pulled down. We were both relieved and thought, well maybe I kicked it when I stepped and didn't notice. I picked it up, and this time I figure out how it needs to be attached to its original position. Once again, I look at Eric and take a step towards him, and we hear a few clangs on the floor and that familiar sliding sound across it, and the bang against the wall. Now we're really scared and frozen, unmoving for what seemed like forever. Then an even louder bang is heard at the other end of the house, and we both jump and stare into the dark hallway. Then again, bang, and then quiet. Then three rapid bangs, Someone was thrashing around in the very last room in the house, and we didn't know what the fuck to do. Determined not to let this person scare us, we run towards that last room and confront this asshole. When we get there, nothing, no one. The room was empty, but how? Who? We were sure it was coming from this room. There's no way whoever it was slipped by us. The room had a sliding glass door leading into the backyard, but it was locked from the inside. Then before we can gather our thoughts and ask each other what was happening, bang, 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 this time from the kitchen. Scared out of my fucking mind, we both agree it's time to leave. We make our way through the back door in the room and finally to the street, all while checking over our shoulders to ensure no one was going to come running out of the house after us. No one came, and the neighborhood was quiet. Eric and I start our walk home, talking about the house, when Eric notices his pocket knife is missing. He then turns his pockets inside out to show me he is not joking. We stop, and he keeps telling me we have to go back for it, since it's his favorite one. Frustrated, I ask him, how did you lose it if it's your favorite knife? He assures me he had never removed it from his pocket and has no idea how it could have been removed from it. I agree to go with him and find it. I can see it's really bothering him because of the expression of pain on his face. He asks me to lift his shirt and look at what could be causing the burning sensation. I lift his shirt and quickly notice three very large scratches starting from his right shoulder blade, going all the way down to his left hip, then from his left hip across to his right hip. I tell him this, and he immediately says the house is haunted, but he still wants to go get the knife. I'm scared, but I'm not going to let him go alone. So, we make our way back into the house and immediately hear that banging noise. But we made a pact with each other, that we would not run, no matter what happened. We begin our search for the knife, looking high and low, all while hearing banging, and now things are being thrown across the room. Of course, I'm fucking scared shitless. I want to leave, 
but we haven't found the knife yet. We do one pass through the entire house and end up in the kitchen. In the kitchen, there's an entrance to the second living room that you can see from the backyard. In that room, there's one piece of furniture, a hutch. Now, we'd already checked this room since it's near our point of entrance, and we found nothing, but we decide one more pass through the room would not hurt. I make my way into the dark room and let my light lead me to the hutch, and there it is. On the hutch, we found the knife, but we for sure checked this room and the hutch. He didn't hesitate for a moment. He grabbed the knife and we hightailed it out through the garage and back onto the street. This is far from the end of the story, but to summarize, this house is fucked up. The rest of the story includes shadow figures sleeping from the bushes, dozens of light bulbs shattering at once, and a knife jammed deep into the front door of the home. So an update to the story, we make our way to our homes, but the entire week we would talk about the house and what was going on in there. We brushed it off and didn't believe it. There had to be some sort of explanation, so we go back, but we bring three friends with us because they wanted to see this haunted house Eric and I wouldn't shut up about. While walking through the backyard, I can't explain it. But for some reason, I wanted to get a closer look at the back house. I started making my way toward the house, but I start to feel scared. A feeling of dread came out of nowhere. I turn away from the house and start my way back to the group. But out of the corner of my eye, I saw something leap from the bushes. Some dark figure leaped from the bushes and into the tall grass. But when I gave it my full attention... It was gone. I stared at the bushes for a moment, a bit confused, but I brushed it off. I did mention it to the group when I caught up with them, but it was quickly dismissed. We enter through the garage door. This time, we noticed a white bookshelf full of light bulbs in the garage. The bookshelf was probably about five feet high and three feet wide, and completely filled with packaged light bulbs. We study it for a moment and make our way into the kitchen, with Eric leading and me in the back. I enter last, and shut the kitchen slash garage door behind me. As soon as I release the doorknob, we hear what sounded like someone in the garage, breaking all the light bulbs on the bookshelf. Stunned, I remember my heart beating a mile a minute, waiting for whatever the fuck it was to start trying to fight its way into the kitchen. But nothing came. And Eric finally said, Fuck, I guess we're not going back now. We make our way to the very last room in the house, the same room Eric and I had exited through the last time we were here. Whatever it was did not disappoint. Random objects were being thrown against the wall in front of us. We could hear a loud banging all through the dark house, like there were people fighting in it. One of our friends decided that he's had enough and opens the glass door to the backyard, and four of us start making our way through it. I turn around to wait for Eric. He was not moving, caught in a daze, standing in front of an unhinged door that was propped against the wall for support. Eric was staring down the hallway as if waiting for something. I had to call his name three times before he realized we were leaving. He stepped forward, and before my eyes... It looked as though someone had tried to throw the unhinged door on top of him. Eric jumped out of the way and started towards me, scared out of his wits. The other three are already almost to the street, so we both just keep the pace and catch up with them. As soon as we reached the street, one of our friends kept telling us how fucked up that house was. You could see the look of terror on his face as he expressed his feelings about the place. He then mentions a burning feeling going up his calf. Sure enough, he's got those fucking scratches starting from his ankle and stopping midway up his calf. Just before we split up to go home, the three of them swear off that place, and that was the last time those three friends spoke to us. The final update. 
We ended up going to that house a few times after that, but nothing absolutely memorable happened. We heard the knocks and bangs and whatnot. It wasn't until we took Eric's older brother, Deacon, that it got crazy. By this time, we visited the house a few times and became numb to the banging and throwing. We found it more amusing than anything, like check this place out, it's haunted. This time, it got more aggressive. After touring the house and seeing Deacon freak out, we decided to have a chat in the kitchen. I was standing in front of the window, leaning against the windowsill. Eric was to my right, leaning against the wall, and Deacon was standing across from me in front of the doorway that leads into the second living room I mentioned earlier. We talk about how scary the house is and all that. Deacon turned around to check out the living room behind him. I mentioned to him that that's the hutch we found Eric's knife on after running around the whole house searching for it. As he turns to face me, Deacon fell into the room almost like something pushed or dragged him from behind. I remember looking at his face and seeing a look of terror as he tried to grab on for dear life to the doorway, but the push or pull was too strong and he fell on his ass into the room. He immediately jumped up and ran over to me. He grabbed me by my shirt and started screaming at me. Yo, what the fuck is your problem? Why did you just push me? I just kept telling him that I didn't push him. Eric jumped between us and confirmed what I was saying. He didn't push you. You fell in. Deacon explains that someone or something pushed him in. After that, he obviously wanted to leave. So we all agreed. But before we leave, Eric and I both told Deacon to check his pockets to see if anything was missing. Of course, his pocket knife is missing. But it's okay. We found the last one. We'll find this one, right? We searched the whole house. Nothing is expected. Now it's time to check the hutch. First pass, nothing. Second pass, nothing. Third, nothing again. Okay. Now this knife is really gone. Deacon wants one more pass through the house. We agree. We make it to the far room with no luck. We start making our way back to the kitchen with me leading. As I'm coming up to the kitchen, my cell phone light starts to reflect off something shining in front of the door that leads into the front yard. It was the knife jammed deep into the door. There was no way that knife could have been jammed into the door without any of us hearing it. Deacon takes his knife, and we leave. I haven't been back after that. Out of all the bullshit that went down in that house, that was the not welcome sign that I took seriously. And that's it. That's everything I can remember. Eric moved not long after that, and I moved away at the end of 2009. I haven't seen that house since, except when I tell the story to friends. I'll pull up the house on Google Images. I visit Eric from time to time, and we always talk about what happened there. Thanks again for being open and understanding. So this happened a few years ago in April, and I still can't shake off how terrifying and strange it was. So I was home alone, getting ready for my 12 o'clock college class that morning, and I opened my blinds to let some natural light in. I glanced out of my window to see a man in his mid-thirties wearing a baseball cap, roaming around my property, with his hands on his hips, walking with a lot of weird confidence. Our yard is kind of off like a cliff, and it looks over onto our five-acre property down below. I live in the Pacific Northwest, so it's a pretty scenic view. I was really confused, and thought maybe it was a worker that my mom had hired for our renovations on the house, admiring the view. I'm a little bit uncomfortable at this point, because the guy walks to the side of the house, out of sight. I head upstairs, and see him now roaming around my front yard and my driveway. He's looking at things and checking out the house and whatever else. He still hasn't seen me at this point. I call my dad and ask him if we've hired anyone to come by the house. He says not that he knows of, 
and tells me he's going to call my mom and ask her, and then he'll call me back. I'm waiting for the call when I notice this strange guy's car. It's a white Honda with no license plates. It's just parked parallel to my front door. The man still hasn't seen me, and he's still wandering around, so I take this as an opportunity to remember that we have a security system, and I armed it. So if he did try to break in, it would immediately alert the police. If this was some sort of professional or worker, he would have rang my doorbell or knocked at least once. He did neither. Just then, I get a call back from my dad saying neither him or my mom hired anyone to come by today. He said that I need to call our local police station immediately. I went back downstairs after making sure to lock every door and window upstairs, and I called my city's police station. I explained to a woman on the other end what's happening, and she decides that she's not going to send an officer out. She instead gives me a number to call there emergency dispatch line and told me to talk to them. I called the number she gave me and immediately I get an automated message saying, thank you for calling the non-emergency hotline. Nobody is available to take your call right now. If this is an emergency, please hang up and dial 911. At this point I'm really irritated because 15 minutes has passed and thus the weird guy is still lurking around my house while I'm home alone and apparently that wasn't enough to warrant an emergency to the lady I called at my local police department. I hung up and decided to call 911. After getting in touch with the 911 operator, I was asked a series of questions about his appearance before they would even alert officers near me to start heading toward my house. The whole thing seemed really weird that nobody was in a hurry to have officers come up to my place when I was a younger girl home alone with a strange man. I asked the officer if I could stay on the line with her when she finally, after what seemed like forever, alerted the police to come to where I was. She agreed, and I went back upstairs to check on the weird guy. He's now sitting in his unplated Honda, either listening to a radio show extremely loudly or on a phone call with someone through his car. It was a very prominent, loud male voice coming from his car. Then, all of a sudden, I hear the tone you hear when someone hangs up on you. The operator was no longer on the line. I was really confused when my thoughts were interrupted by an unrecognized phone number calling me. I assumed it was the operator calling me back, so I picked it up. Instead, I was greeted by really creepy, heavy breathing. I'm not sure whose it was, but it really freaked me out. I hung up immediately and dialed back 911. I had been pretty calm up to this point, but that phone call put me in a panic mode. I got on the phone with another operator who already knew my situation and address before I could even explain it to her. She said the cops were on their way. 20 minutes had passed at this point. The guy is still here in his car, and the cops haven't arrived. Keep in mind, I live in a smaller town, so there's no reason why it took the cops as long as it did to come down. Finally, this guy's leaving my driveway right as the cops pull in. They stop him and ask him a few questions. A cop then comes to my door, hands me a sketchy-looking flyer saying, it was just a landscaper. He said he had an appointment. I was really relieved and irritated that it was just a guy my mom had hired, until I realized it wasn't. I called my mom back and said, the cop said it was just a landscaper that you hired and that he had an appointment. My mom replies with, I can assure you we never hired a landscaper. We don't even need one. Lately I've been noticing something off about home, like there's something else there with me, my wife, and our two dogs, but I've not been able to put my finger on it until today. For some context, I live in a duplex. We share the property with another guy in his mid-twenties. He has his own house and we have ours. 
but we share our laundry room that leads to our respective backyards that are separated by a fence. This all started around two months ago when the guy sent me a text. Hey man, just a heads up, someone stole my bike out of the sunroom. This is extra creepy because to get to our sun slash laundry room, you would need to hop the brick fence surrounded by shrubby trees and then hurl the bike over unless the thief had the most massive pair of balls ever and walked it out through one of our front doors when we weren't home. Either way, I didn't feel right and made more of an effort to keep the door locked. Fast forward a couple of weeks ago, I let my dogs into the backyard and one of them starts sniffing at the shed. No big deal. The lizards are coming out with it heating up. They've probably just chased one under the door. I finally got them to come in, but I didn't give it much thought. I hardly ever go into that shed. Nothing wrong with it. It's just kind of out of the way, and I'm not really a hang-out-in-the-shed type of guy. So we generally use it for storage, suitcases, furniture that doesn't fit or match the house, camping stuff, you know, boring suburban shit. We probably enter it three times a year. After the 18th day in a row of my dogs being curious about the shed, I decide to have a little look-see to see if maybe there was a Komodo dragon or something in there, since they wouldn't let this thing go. No, no Komodo dragon, but what I did find literally made me piss myself just a bit, just a few drops. Inside the shed was the bike that my neighbor had stolen a little while back. My first thought was, Oh fuck, my wife is a klepto, but I quickly ruled that out. She doesn't even like to bike. Then I was briefly worried that my neighbor would think that I was the thief. I mean, it's in my shed. I don't know how to explain that if he ever found out. Plus, I wanted to give him his bike back. I kept looking around and found one of our sleeping bags unraveled, but balled up behind a box. Inside of it was a sack of what looked to be around $20 in change and singles. There was also a bag for garbage and it had lots of food wrappers inside of it. Eventually, my brain accepted what it was ultimately denying at first and put two and two together. Someone, I don't know who, is living in my shed, or at least was. Maybe my dog spooked them off, or maybe they sleep there during the night and leave during the day. If they weren't coming back, why would they leave the change? I left everything how I found it and began thinking about what I should do next. Whoever did it must have gotten in through a spare set of keys I keep hidden in my backyard. I locked up and brought them inside with me tonight. Hopefully, whoever it is gets the message and moves on. I'm going to install cameras tomorrow. I'll keep you guys posted if anything more happens. Please hope for the best and that this person is not a lunatic. I'm in my early 20s and a female. About nine months after I'd moved into my new place, Someone started pounding at my door a little past 11.30 p.m. I was already in bed by this point and was awfully concerned about this person at my door. My upstairs neighbor's aquarium had broken the night before and it was flooding into my living room. Since I just had a fiasco with my neighbor late at night, I figured it was probably just her again and almost just opened the door without hesitation. Right before I opened it up, I had this horrid feeling wash over me, so instead, I meekly said, Hello? Through the door. I heard a man reply, saying, Hi, I'm a friend of David Jones. The second I heard him speak, my blood went cold. I had a terrible feeling about this. David Jones was the name of the previous tenant. He was very elderly and disabled. He was in a wheelchair and lived with a helper. He passed away before I moved in. I looked out the peephole, and he was wearing sunglasses. Again, remember it was almost midnight. He also had a black face mask and a black hoodie with the hood up. 
I said, David doesn't live here anymore. I'm sorry. This man pounds his fist on my door again and laughs, saying, Oh yeah? Open the door and prove it. Like I said, David was in a wheelchair and needed a ramp for the door, which was removed before I even moved in. I also drive a motorcycle, and my immediate neighbors don't drive any particularly wheelchair-accessible vehicles. With all this in mind, you would think someone who feels comfortable enough with David to be knocking down his door in the middle of the night, after at least almost a year of no communication, would be able to evaluate the situation and see that there are no wheelchair modifications, apologize for the mix-up, and be on their merry way. Well, this wasn't the case. He was still pounding at the door and telling me to open up. I told him David is not here, I'm not opening the door, and that he needs to leave. He was standing outside my place for a few more minutes. I was scared and standing frozen by my door. I saw him walk away. I was still by my door when I heard someone rustling around by my back door over by where my bedroom is. I was still frozen. I didn't want to believe that someone could actually be by my bedroom window. For clarification, the area by my window is attached to a common area yard for all of the residents. It's directly off the sidewalk of a relatively busy area, so it isn't uncommon to have someone in the yard, but it is certainly uncommon to have someone directly up against your porch and windows. I heard something loud happen in my bedroom. I grabbed my pepper spray and cautiously approached the room. No one broke in, but something still seemed really off. After a while, I hadn't seen this person anywhere. I decided to go back to bed. In the morning, I came out for a smoke and saw that my bedroom window screen had been ripped off. It was all bent out of shape. It definitely didn't look like it just randomly fell off. I knew exactly what happened. That guy ripped off the screen and tried to get in through my bedroom window. Thankfully, it was locked and I also have window jammers. This obviously frightened me, but there's not much that I could do at this point. A few weeks later, someone tried to open my front door in the middle of the day. No knocks, no nothing. I just heard my door clearly try to be opened. I shot up and ran to the peephole to see a man dressed in all black, hood up with some sunglasses on, he tried to open the door a couple more times and pushed against it really hard. I was trying to think of something intimidating to say or something to get him to stop at least. My brain decided it was a great idea to just hit my door. It worked though, so hey. I slapped the back of my door really hard and the guy jumped up three feet and ran away. Now here's where I think it gets really bizarre. So I googled my address Everything online for my current residence still lists David Jones as the active resident. I 100% think that guy saw me, a young female all alone, and googled my address. He was trying to get my trust into opening the door. I think after that didn't work, he was still trying to get in. Hence the bedroom window. Him coming back a few weeks later is very weird in my opinion. You would think he would have either moved onto a new target or would have been much more interested in getting in sooner. I definitely don't think that he knew David. I don't think he owed him money or was family or any of that. So the timeline is bizarre. But maybe he already had other victims and just decided to try my place again. At any rate, his plan didn't work and he was gone. Literally months upon months go by Someone knocks gently at my door at around 9 p.m. I go up to look, and what do you know? An individual covered in black, head to toe, with sunglasses on. I didn't answer or make any noise. He slowly turns the door handle and pushes on the door. He then takes a few steps back, walks to my neighbor's door, and I heard him try theirs. My neighbor is a middle-aged man living alone. The door didn't open, and I see him walk up the stairs and can hear him trying yet another neighbor's door. This apartment has five people living in it, including a child. 
That door didn't open, and he tried the remaining door. That didn't currently have anyone living in it. He failed again. Creepy, all right. So that's what makes me think he didn't single me out as a vulnerable female, because he just seems to be trying to get into anywhere he can. I do think it's rather strange that my cats hate him. I've never seen either of them hiss, except for when this guy is at my door. They always are clearly very frightened, and are ready to fight, which is majorly unlike either of them. You honestly wouldn't even know they have teeth or claws, Unless you're a laser pointer or a cardboard box. Back in early January, our clad in black lad is back. My brother, who looks quite intimidating, was over for a visit. He heard someone trying to open my door. He got up, opened the door, and saw this guy actively trying to open my middle-aged neighbor's door. The guy ran for his life. My brother wasn't aware that this was an ongoing issue, and where he thought it was weird... He wasn't trying to run after this guy either. Today, I was taking a nap, and at around 2pm, I hear an aggressive knock on my door. It pauses for a few moments, and then picks back up. While this is happening, I heard my upstairs neighbor quickly close their windows. I was tired, and figured it was the same creep, so I didn't even bother looking. After a few minutes, I heard him knocking on my neighbor's door. After that failed, he went upstairs and knocked on the two doors up there for a bit. After a while, the knocking stopped, and I heard my neighbors open their windows back up. I couldn't sleep anymore, so I grabbed my smokes and headed outside. I could hear my neighbors through their open window. This little girl was asking her mom who that guy is, why he keeps doing this. I know of him bothering them at least twice, but it could definitely be more. I have reported this to my landlord. She is absolutely no help and basically just tells me not to answer the door if I feel unsafe and to call the police if it escalates. Police don't have a quick enough response time to come out here when it's happening. I did call them before and I don't have much of a description for them to go off of. Basically, they told me not to open the door if I feel unsafe and to call them if it escalates. You would think someone ripping my bedroom screen off would count as escalating, but I guess not. This guy has been bothering me for a little over a year now, and apparently my neighbors as well. It seems really weird for a criminal to do. Just keeps trying to break in to the same group of apartments over and over again, all hours of the day and night. I guess I just have no idea what he is after. For anyone who saw my last post that might be wondering if this is the same neighbor that tried to drug me, I suppose it is possible, but he doesn't look like the same build. The peephole does give some type of distortion, so I guess it could just be that. It really could be. I'm not sure. I think it's unlikely especially with trying everyone's door and not just mine, but it certainly could be. This stranger is harassing my neighbors and I consistently, and none of us even know what he looks like. Don't open your doors to strangers, folks, no matter what time of day it is. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. To Laura Williams, Moxed, Roe Harper, Pretty in Pink, Johnny C, Kim Thompson, Kristen Collins, Anne Sherry Smith, Felicia Tayshur, Shannon Evans, Amy Chambers, Adam Ernest, Alexander Wilson, Calamity Jade, 
Maureen Baumgartner, Tyson Allen, Tyler Wilson, Alexandria Bannock, It's Me, Ryan, Trevor Blockley, Cassandra Bricker Wyatt, Patty's niece, Ariara Yasharala L, Deb Foster, Kathleen Greer, Lynn Meese, Ryan, Chris Lawson, Joe Jordan, Lise Mendoza, Brooke, Nikki Bundrant, Thomas Doolittle, The Tijara, Brooke, Nikki Bundrant, Thomas Doolittle, Jennifer Chamberlain, Denise Watson, Zero Bite, Erica Asir, Forgotten Ruins TV, Night Shadow, Healing with Ev, Talisha Kluss, Donna Cox, Holy Crusader, Sheila Grant 44, Julie Hebbins, Stephanie McLaren, Janet Mills Rice, Bob Jeff, Master Dom Howie, Denise Watson, Roz, Cassandra Wyatt, Travis Smith, Zoe D, Kat Philbin, Melissa Friesen, Lorna Clark, Kathy Richmond, Natasha Hensley, Jaleesa Ferguson, Leah McBride, Emily Pearson, Tyler Wilson, Lynn Meese, Kristen Birdo, Shaz, Betty Brantley, Candice Lee, Africa Winfield, Becca, Lydia Adams, Girl Veteran, Legends CBZ 69 2012, Katrina King, Hospital Cakewalk, Dirty Diana, Quinta Siegel, Shirley Porch, Taylor Ruist, Annalisa Petrie, Jasmine Davis, Janelle Jensen, Jasper Roth, Alex, Monica Levelace, James Gargano, Sarah P, Fire 05, Matt is a Felter, Tierra Sanders, Melissa Kingery, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Chelsea Moffat, Ryan, Gabrielle, Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Leticia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sarah Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003, Bella Plays, 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Op, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Adwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kell, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, The Wendy, Ember Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mayers, Unladylike 13, Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant 44, Sona, Scout Mom 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindon, Z Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racour, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zeferano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, 
Vicki Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D, Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.